Welcome to Lightbox Online. This is the DeviantArt Personal Work to Paid Work panel. My name is Justin Maller. I am the Chief Creative at DeviantArt and a digital artist. I'm very excited to introduce you to my panelists. Uh, DJ, why don't you kick us off? Who are you and what do you do? I'm DJ Welch. I'm the art lead at Twitter right now, I'm working um, to help out in the camera team to help out on their new stuff there. Uh, I've been doing concept art for maybe like 11 years now, and uh, look for this panel. Amazing. Claire, tell us a bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Claire Hummel. Uh, I'm currently an artist at Valve. Uh, I joined with the Campo Santo team working on In the Valley of Gods, and we just shipped Half-Life Alex. Um, I've been in the games industry for about 10 years, worked on Bioshock Infinite, uh, Westworld VR at HBO, and a bunch of much smaller, worse projects. So. <laughs> Amazing. Ajay, take us home. Uh, and I'm the youngest one here, so I have the least experience. Um, yeah. I, I started doing concept art uh, professionally about like seven or eight years ago. Uh, I'm most well known for my realistic Pokemon, um, and uh, I worked on Detective Pikachu. Wonderful. So in this panel today, the four of us are going to be discussing personal work. The work that we make for ourselves in our own time for our own reasons and where it leads in our career, the opportunities that it opens up and uh, the things that we learn and take away from it. So I think an intelligent place to start is to just ask, what was your first personal project uh, of substance? Like the first time that you decided to really do something with a defined outcome and parameters instead of just randomly practicing. First one in gets a Snickers. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'll go first. Uh, yeah, the first project I did uh, was kind of like in school, they didn't, they weren't using digital tools yet. So I was learning Photoshop on my own after school. And I was like, well, I like Avatar, so maybe I'll age up their characters and just kind of do a concept exploration on that. And that was like a, a pretty big project for me. Um, By Avatar, you mean uh, James Cameron's last, Avatar, right? Yes, that no, Avatar Last <laughs> Airbender. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, after our last Airbender, make the old blue Navi characters even yeah. bigger and older. Um, but yeah, so it was after our last Airbender characters, I was aging up because uh, I got into the series I think right after it ended. So I was like, oh, I wish there was more. Let's keep going. Yeah, I uh, had uh, <laughs> my. I've always been like really project focused. Just like in high school, I was you know wanted to make my own like video game, right? Like a big GRPG. Yeah. Um, which, you know, of course, is like the most complicated game a person can make. And I was like 14 and had no idea. Um, but in art, like when I first got into college, I started doing like Kingdom Hearts versions of other pop culture video game characters. Um, and they're terrible now. Don't look them up. But like that was like one of my first sort of like uh, really goal oriented projects to like have like a consistent style and like, you know, uh, visual through line. Uh, it's hard to place for me. I think like RJ, I was very project project based as a kid. Um, my dad worked in animation, so I was always like, I'm going to be a commercial artist when I grow up. Oh, and so, <laughs> yeah, for better. I didn't even know it was a thing until I went to art school. <laughs> <laughs> I was very spoiled. <laughs> so like, my I have memories of like going to the office with dad. And just like paging through Prince of Egypt model sheets and just being like, I'm going to draw characters for this. And they're going to put it in the movie, I say, as like a nine-year-old. <laughs> and so nice. I'd put together these full books with like just terribly drawn turnarounds of a cat character for Ramses. And I was just so, oh, the confidence of being that young and that stupid. I was so convinced that it would actually go into the movie. And yet I, all of you have examples of a project with a scope that ambitious that did result in exactly that. I'm looking at you, RJ. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, when I was like 22, I started doing realistic Pokemon. Um, like all through art school, I was like, hey, I'm going to be a human character designer. It just never really clicked for me until I started doing more monsters. Um, and then once I like got this realistic Pokemon idea, people seemed to really like it. So I kept doing more and it sort of like uh, led me to every career opportunity, including getting to work on Detective Pikachu. Um, so that was a pretty cool experience uh like the best possible conclusion out of drawing some fan art well, yeah, i mean that's that's one to one but dj and claire i know you guys have ones that are similar to that right yeah i feel like mine's a little 
a little in that same vein where it's very much like you are good at this thing, come do this thing on our project, which was I did this series of, I called them historically accurate Disney princesses. Now I would call them historically accurate-ish Disney princesses um, because my sister was working at Colonial Williams, Williamsburg and so I was spending all of this time around people in historical costuming and I just completely fell into it. And then when Bioshock Infinite got announced, I remember seeing the trailer and quite like privately doing little drawovers of Elizabeth's outfit to make it more historically accurate. And then totally unrelated to that, they saw my historical princesses and reached out to me to design young Elizabeth and the Lou Test twins because they wanted a historical eye for it. So it was really neat to see that like the fact that it was fan art was the hook, but what they what they took away from it was the passion for design and for historical fashion and bringing that on to their project, which was super fun. DJ, what you got for us? Anything like mine? So, so mine was a little weird. Like those avatar drawings I did, they got pretty popular online. And then uh, I was going around to conventions and selling my artwork. And I found out Cartoon Network was at a, doing a portfolio review. I think at Anime Expo in 2009. And I didn't have a portfolio at the time. I just threw my pictures in there and then ran over to the portfolio review. And they're like, we love this. Uh, you want to be an intern, storyboard intern on a couple shows? And I was like, yeah. Was, the shows I was on were uh, Fire Breather and Adventure Time Season 1. Holy heck. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. pretty cool. There you go. So look, the, the, the coolest sort of like tenet that we have in this panel is that these personal projects can and will, like if pursued enough and if enough application is put into them over time, lead to bigger opportunities. Like, I know you all just gave an example of, of, of that being true, but is that something you fundamentally believe in? Like, is it that direct of a corollary or do you think it's a little bit more nuanced than that? I, think it's I mean, direct. I think <laughs> anytime, you know, you have like a passion for something and like, like, you know, you get really into it. I think people can tell and people want to pay you for passion. Um, so I think like, like having fan art, like, you know, getting really into somebody else's IP, like is a good example to show like a would-be art director to hire you'd be like, hey, you know, I can tell this person gets into stuff that they didn't create. Like maybe they'll get into the thing that we want to hire them for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not, not only that, like I remember when I was going to school, people were like, don't do other people's characters don't do other IPs. And I'm like, what do you think art directors and, and producers are looking for? They want to right. see that you can already do, they don't want to hire you and then have to teach you how to do it. If you already can do it, it's much easier to just slot you into that job. Yeah, like doing fan art, I feel like is proving that you can play around in someone else's sandbox. And that is a very specific skill set. I know tons of artists who do their own IPs and their own work who would hate working in a studio environment. And fan art just puts you up for that gives you those expectations of knowing the box you're working within, knowing the parameters and how to play around with that and expand on it. Um, and as RJ said, it's just that passion, I think, stands out to people. Like I have seen so many artists bring portfolios to me where I'm like, I know the exact studios you're looking at that you are desperately trying to make art that fits into what they are trying to do instead of just being like, just I mean, know what the jobs entail, but draw what you love, draw what you're passionate about, whether that's fan art, whether that's personal projects, whether that's auto bio, like that passion always comes through. And I think when people are hiring, it's, it makes more of an impact than you think. Well, and by that same token, you want to like, you could, it's really easy to tell when somebody like, like they're just doing what's already been done. You know, it's like, if you're going to do fan art or something, don't do what already exists, like bring your own personality in and interest into it. And then uh, I think people, that's what people sort of like latch on to. Um, you know, anybody can just draw a Pokemon, but like if you draw them like, you know, with an interesting idea, like that's what people are, are going to gravitate towards. Yeah. Passion meets originality is where you really get the fireworks that can, you know, set something off, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, hey, like, let, let's stay with passion for a minute because I think that that's really important. And I think that's what's so valuable about these personal projects. Um, but I think that the passions evolve over time, specifically as they pertain to subject matter. I think as creative people, the desire to create seldom dims. But I think that like your, your interests and the avenues that they take change over time and your passions change. So you guys have all, all spoken like in, you know, at, at a little bit of length already about the passion you had for existing um, IP and existing things. Have you found over time that that's strengthened 
uh, moved adjacent or moved towards creating more original or historical based stuff? Like what's, what's your evolution been from a passion perspective? I think you have to like rekindle your passion over and over again <laughs> when you're sticking with the same subject. I've gone through ebbs and flows with my passion of art where you get to a place where like, I want to do something else. I want to do something different. Uh, I found tricks for myself to like get back into that passion by returning to what kind of got me interested in doing art in the first place. But for myself, it's kind of, I kind of like switch uh, my hyper focus onto something else. Like I want to learn script writing or I want to learn storyboarding or I want to learn directing or, but it's all still within that creative realm for myself at least. I mean, for me, uh, I don't feel like I'm that good at art yet. So I like, I'm, I'm hyper-focused on just wanting to do the one thing um, and get good at the one thing. Plenty uh, good, man. <laughs> I mean, people say that, but like, you know, there's so many kinds of animals out there and I want to be able to draw them all like really good. Um, I can draw them okay, but you know, it's like, it's one step at a time. Like the, the fun thing about creatures as opposed to doing like human characters is like, you're never going to be out of subjects to draw. Um, and it takes me sure. so goddamn long to draw just one thing that like, I have so many ideas I'm never going to get to. So I'm never like, out of that passion because there's always the next project I want to be working on while I'm spending 50 hours on this one project. <laughs> I'm glad we all still think we're bad artists, even though we're yeah. close to a decade into doing it. I feel like art needs so much more time than a lot of other skills to like get good at. Yeah. Like, that 10,000 yeah, hours is hard to find art at all. I mean, how many times have we done 10,000? You know, I worked out, I joined DeviantArt over 19 years ago now. That's oh. crazy. Wow. I've done my 10,000 hours so many times. I don't think 10,000 hours is anywhere near enough. Yeah. No. No. Um, sorry, Claire, we didn't get to hear about your, your you know, interest evolution, if you have, or we can just move on. Uh, I, I think my interests, I, my interests sort of transform. I have a lot of non-art interests that then just feed into my art, which is a thing I recommend to artists all the time, is don't just, don't just spend all your time stuck in those insular art communities like read get passions about science and history whatever else um so like i grew up as a kid loving dinosaurs and egypt and the old west and all of this stuff that has evolved and morphed over time into much more like critical and thoughtful interests in the same topics um so just finding new depths and new perspectives on things that I loved as a kid and finding ways to integrate that into my work and to engage with it differently. Because um, I mean, we're all, we're all still the same people we were when we were younger, but you're just evolving and kind of shifting that perspective, so. Definitely. I think there's real value as well um, in getting back into the beginner mindset. DJ, I'm the same as you. Like I tend to pivot to other mediums altogether when I get burnt out on creating visual art, you know, hence all the guitars in the background. I'm terrible at guitar. But like I'm really enjoying being terrible again. It's really wonderful having no stakes to something that I'm creating after a lifetime being spent where everything I make needs to have a certain amount of value. And so that's yeah, what's falling in love with that uncomfortability is a good thing to do. Yes. I'm always uh, changing careers. Like people look at my resume like, wait, you're a storyboarder, concept artist, you work in AR, VR, what do you what what do you do? Like I just work in ideation and drawing well helps me with that. Yeah. So I, I guess um what I what I wanted to ask was like I should have lost track of what I wanted to ask. I had a great follow-on question from the beginner mindset thing and changing tax. Um Enjoying ah, yes. other things. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, what I was going to ask is that, you know, as, as you evolve throughout your career and you get away from that beginner mindset and into a position where everything that you make does need to provide some kind of a value, has it changed your relationship with your personal work? Do you view your personal work as something that you need to capitalize on? Or do you view it more as just something that enriches you and your creativity? I mean, yes, um, <laughs> like for me anyway, uh, like everything I draw, you know, like there's in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, I need to be able to make money from this somehow. Right. <laughs> it's like, like even like my, I'm lucky that like a lot of my personal interests have like translated into being like profitable. Um, so I can like draw my dinosaurs and like the stuff that I get like really into and people will be like, this is still good. I'm going to give you money for something. Um, so I, I got fortunate there, but like, you know, it sucks. Like there's, 
everything that I, I want to draw, I have to have that in mind. Otherwise it's just like, you know, well, that was a waste of a week. Like, you know, I'm happier, yeah. but like, did I make any money? <laughs> I feel like that is, that is a hard trade off and one that I want to get better about is I, I truly miss the days of being in high school and just trading sketchbooks back and forth with friends and not doing it for any reason other than that drawing was fun and it was fun showing it to a small curated selection of people. Um, and now as an adult, just every line I put to paper, I'm so hyper aware of being like, is this a waste of time? Instead of being like, no, just making art is important. You're stretching those muscles. You're just, it's just invigorating as a human being to make art. Um, and so I, I'm really trying to, to pump the brakes on that in terms of like, I love going out and doing plein air drawings of rocks. And then I get home and I'm immediately like, well, maybe I could collect them into a book and publish it. <laughs> Instead of just like being in the moment and enjoying it for what it is. So oh, that's, a, that's a tough one. I hit that wall probably like six years into my art career where I, I was like looking at everything as a project, everything for money, everything for the amount of likes or views, or it was very like a, it was very transaction transactional um and that's what kind of made me kind of look outside of art um for things like acting or doing something else like heck the thing behind me right now is a, a this is the backdrop of a video gaming channel i started last year like i, I just I, th I think like it's really important to consume and do a lot of different things beyond just art and art communities um to kind of keep it going and keep your mind from like focusing too much on being like this drawing is for this project. This drawing is for the likes or my audience to grow. Cause I get very unhappy when I find like, when I get in those places where I'm like, okay, this, this piece I did, did this well, got me this many followers. And it, it just becomes way too oh. transactional for me. Yeah. It's terrible. Well, let's delve into that a little more deeply because you know, every art, like nearly every artist I think is very aware of the reception that their work gets. I'd say that there's a few people out there um, who are enlightened enough to operate in a way where they create and release and don't monitor the reception. I I'm not one of them. That. Yeah. I, I do, I care, I, I, and I check. Um, but I wanna ask you guys how much it impacts what you create and how actively you work to either like enrich that and, and pander towards that to grow the audience and to grow the business opportunities or actively move away from that and just remember to make your own work. I don't think there's a wrong approach there either, by the way, there's validity to both. It's, and it's a difficult choice. I'm in the, I'm in the actively trying not to right now. Like I, <laughs> I post and run. Um, I also don't often post on um, uh, social media as much as I used to back in the day when I was growing my audiences. Uh, I, I'm really focusing on creating um, my own projects and getting my own projects and shows made. So hopefully, the, it's like winning the lottery, but that's what I want to focus on right now. You're reaching that point of enlightenment that I can hear. <laughs> I'm, hoping that, I'm hoping that my trajectory is going in that same direction. I'm not sure how well I'm acting on it. Um, but I, as DJ was saying, I would find that same that same feeling of things getting so transactional and just being hyper aware of if I'm posting too much or not enough, or if I say anything on main, how people are yeah. going to take it. And just, so I've turned into just this emotionless void on my main Twitter that occasionally posts art. Um, but I've, I've also picked up other hobbies and started some longer term projects that just can't be shared as immediately or shared to a small group of friends. And it feels so good and freeing to just be like, oh, I can just run it by trusted artists who I know and get feedback. And I don't have to constantly be monitoring the potential. Can I ask you a question? Is, is it as weird for you? Like, like you get, you post on social media and you get like thousands of likes on a drawing, but then um, you draw something that's like you care much more about and you show it to like three or four of your art friends that you really care about their opinions and they like talk about it. I'm so much more excited about seeing their comments. So much better. Yeah. So much better. Oh, when yeah. I post something on private and I get like two comments from friends about how they like it, I was like, ah, oh, yeah. this will sustain me forever. Yeah. I mean, that's what it was like in high school, right? You know, like you just, yeah, like, yeah you show like your, your five friends and like, you know, you get feedback from them and if they like it, like you're doing a good job. But now it's like, you know, if you get 10,000 likes, like you're doing a good job. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, and like then if you don't get 10,000 likes, you feel bad and you're like, I don't want, why did I get this? I don't want this feeling. I don't want to get yeah. emotional baggage every time I post. It's horrible. 
maybe I'm a bad artist now. <laughs> Just <laughs> yeah. Tanked. Yeah. Oh. So, like, d diving back a little closer to the, the bone of this conversation, like, have you, is, is there an instance you guys can think of a, a project you did that left you with a skill that ended up being pivotal for other projects moving forward, for paid projects? Like I know for myself, I did a year long project once and came up with the geometric style that I've used in nearly every client project that I've done since. Had I not done that year long project, uh, I can't, couldn't even give you the client list I wouldn't have. Yeah. You know, I mean? do you guys have examples of that? Sure, like every project I work on. Uh, <laughs> like, I mean, the, the big one for me was probably, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I spent like a year reconstructing the T-Rex, like going through uh, like every single muscle that I could, like reading like 22 scientific papers. Um, but through that project, like it completely reshaped my understanding of like, you know, dinosaur anatomy and therefore I can bring that into dragons and fucking like everything else. Um, so it's just like, like that was a uh, you know a very rough year working on that thing but it's also like paid off and like uh, so many projects now are like so much faster because i know exactly the anatomy and where it's supposed to go now and like that's that's become a shortcut for me yeah that's cool yeah i mean like every project i think not not every but there's definitely certain big ones for me that like taught me my cell shading style taught me my rendering style that taught me uh, how I like to handle backgrounds, what shots I like to use to tell what type of uh, emotion or the type of storytelling element. But I do, I, this is a personal question, RJ, I do want to see what your interpretation of like a, an accurate T-Rex looks like, like as opposed oh. to just the, like sure. a scaled one that you always see in movies, but I, I think you have oh, something probably so pretty fat. different. So yeah, nice. it's it's yeah, it's chunky. Um, no, you you can see it uh, on my website or uh, whatever. We actually so I made it for an indie game I work on called Saurian, which is like it's all about doing the scientifically accurate dinosaurs for one specific ecosystem, um, oh. and T Rex is part of that. So I got to like through that project, I've make, made many like paleontologist contacts, and uh, that's so awesome, that's like man. I was able to like you know talk to them and pick their brain for the whole thing. So like technically, I guess it counts as peer reviewed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so right now T Rex is probably scaly, um, and if it had feathers, it would have been like an elephant, just like a few, you know, sporadic feather like hair. Mm -hmm. oh. I feel like for me, a lot of my personal projects are pretty different from my professional work, since most of my professional work is concept art, which is a lot looser and rougher. Um, but I think doing the plan, the plein air rock studies, was something that really gave me a very specific. Uh, line language and hatching language that I then turned into reaching out to 59 Parks, which is the screen printed poster series, and doing a couple posters for them. And that process of doing posters for them and doing my own separations was what got Mondo's attention to do a Jurassic Park poster for them. And so that sort of like learning on the job um, and using projects to get better at things and push yourself further will definitely get you gigs further down the line, which is great. Also, can I just say, Claire, that um, the way you draw rocks makes me very insecure about the rocks in my own paintings. Oh, um, thank you. And I have to like put a little bit more effort in, even though I don't know shit about rocks. <laughs> well, I was drawing that, I was drawing that Utah Ceratops in the uh, Jurassic Park thing. I changed it and made a Utah Ceratops. Um, <laughs> and the whole time I was like, I hope RJ likes this skeleton. <laughs> It turned out well. You did a good job. The Mutual Admiration Society here is wonderful. I love your rocks. I love your stairs. <laughs> That's how it wonderful. goes. I have long since accepted that I can't become the best artist at everything. And it's very freeing to just kind of revel in the work of your friends and all the good stuff they do. So I don't believe you. I think you are one of the best artists at everything. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to imagine that a lot of people who tuned in to watch a panel called personal work to paid work are going to be students and younger people who are looking to move into the sort of career spaces that you guys have now. Do you have any advice or anything that you would recommend them to do? Would you be like, draw every day for a month or just do this or just do that? Like for myself, I would say, if the idea of making a piece every day for a year doesn't make you feel nauseous, you should totally try and do it. <laughs> it really depends on the artist you're talking to, like when you're giving a portfolio review. Some people you meet and they're just having having a tough time getting their foot in the door and they're ready um, to. Some people still need to keep working on their craft a little more before they can jump in there and, and fill a, 
a junior position. But um, I usually give artists before the Rona attacked, uh, I, I would tell them to go to conventions. Um, you meet so many good artists, so many art directors are going there, try and have a table. That really is a great step for finding um, your voice and also getting your work in front of people and meeting other artists who are in the industry who can help you get that first job. And it's very humbling in a really good way to just sit behind a table and just be like, this is it. Yeah. I am here by my own hand if I succeed or fail. And it forces you to talk to a bunch of strangers and sell your work. And it's, it's a lot, but it's very good. I mean, for me, oh, you, you, you oh I was just going to say that I don't draw every day. So I feel bad giving that advice to younger students, but I did draw every day probably when I was younger. Um, I think, f I think draw every day, if I would translate that advice into just allowing yourself to draw, as we've been saying, in ways that aren't for anything, that are just putting marks on paper that are loosening up, loosening up your hand, um, especially before a work day, because the number of times where I've just gotten a slow start to my work day because I was trying to just start cold on a piece for work instead of just letting myself revel in being in Photoshop for a for an hour or so, I think is really important. Um, and do master studies, look at artists outside of your field. It's very obvious when I see portfolios for concept art and they're just looking at an art station um, or for animation, we're just looking at animation artists. It's like they already have Brittany Lee, they already have Corey Loftus, they don't need a second one. Um, yeah. Or when they look at Disney, I'm just saying, Ajay. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So one of the things that <clears throat> I see a lot, uh, especially on like, you know, social media right now is so many, you know, like young artists, like 18, 19 years old are really ready. They want to be, you know, making money. So they put out a price sheet and like, and now that turns their art into like, you know, a Burger King menu, right? It's like, this is the products that they have. This is the skills that they have right now. This is what you have to expect from them. So like, instead of creating, you know, like challenging themselves and like experimenting and creating like, you know, new interesting pieces where, you know, they have the opportunity to fail. Instead, they're expected to create like, you know, a predetermined product. And that like leads to so many artists to stagnate. Like I know like all these like, you know, 26, 27 year olds who've just been drawing like the same shit for like 10 years because like that's all they've, you know, been expected to draw. They've never like had to push themselves instead of like, you know, making 50 bucks for a character, they could be making like $2,000 for a character. Um, yeah, and right. they just never like, had that opportunity. That you place it, it's interesting that you place it on that, um, that system. That they get complacent with it, with that, that menu that they've made and it really locks them into that headshot bus shot full body yeah. kind of thing and you're like that's your life now line work <laughs> color fully rendered yeah, background, right. no background and it's like and the I same thing with patreon oh yeah exactly yeah. and i was saying i was just talking with a buddy on twitter like a couple days ago about this that it's hard to shift as an artist in the day of social in the days of social media because suddenly people are following you for a specific thing and if you get passionate about something new you risk losing followers you risk people being super rude and calling you out and saying they liked your older art better and so just allowing yourself to to not see as much value in that and just grow as an artist regardless of what your specific audience is during that transition period you know it's like trying to stop a train and like reroute it in a different direction like you're going in this <laughs> yeah. one path and you have all these people like giving you momentum and you're like oops never mind i don't want to draw that anymore um and now you're gonna have to like build up that momentum again in a different path i think that's one thing i'm really jealous of is creative people i see whose audiences are really accepting of their multidisciplinary ways and aren't, don't have this strong expectation of one outcome I know that when I share stuff that's not like specifically aligned with exactly what my audience is expecting to see, there's a real visceral reaction to it in so far as that it's not much of a reaction to it. <laughs> yeah. You almost have to train your audience to like expect that from you. Like Just I always said, like, balls all the time. yeah, I always said like a good way to get people into your, like, this was back in the day, but it's pretty, tr it's not a new concept anymore. But when I was coming up with it, like you, I would always say like, do two fan arts, one original. And you just kind of keep that system going until you can just do all original art if that's what you're really looking for. But yeah. you can kind of keep your audience engaged, giving them the thing they really want to see, but then kind of getting them trained and interested in seeing something else outside of just that fan art stuff that you were a part of that fandom. Yeah. If you do that for long enough, they'll just watch you play video games. <laughs> yes. <Turns out. laughs> Any video game you want. Doesn't even have to be new ones. <laughs> Follow the Ego Raptor path. <laughs> yeah. 
So I, I think an interesting thing to touch on might be we're, we've seen a real um, seismic shift, I would say in the last five years or so, that's really empowered creators uh, in a way that we haven't seen before. It's come through streaming, it's come through communities and social media. But another way to look at like going from personal work to paid work is to monetize your personal work. But I feel like there's, there's been a way that you've been able to do it recently where even your process can be monetized as people tune in to watch you create and watch you learn and do all of that. Um, I, I know personally speaking, like my advice to like an artist who is coming up now would be to consider that, consider building out your, your, your content reach as well as just like that finished product. Do you guys think this, is, that, is this a bubble or is this the kind of thing that we're going to see like have legitimacy and legs moving forward? I think in the same way that I remember excitedly downloading tutorials from DeviantArt like 14 years ago or something, I think there's always going to be an appeal to that. Um, and, I, and I don't think you can force your way into it. I'm definitely not as inclined to it as I have my friend Justin Oaksford and my buddy Nick Cole are both people who are just born instructors and they just love sharing process and they love giving feedback and they are not anxious about it at all. Um, and so I think if that's something that someone comes naturally to, then it's it's absolutely an option. Like I, I buy things often on Gumroad that I already know how to do, but I just want to see how someone else talks through it. I want to see their specific Photoshop process because we're all just using this weird ancient hacked together program that has a million ways to do the same thing, so. I mean, do you guys find that like, um... I don't know, most of my art friends are more excited about buying books that show sketchy stuff, unfinished works from, from real artists that we love than the finished art pieces. Like it's just like these, it's almost like deconstructing how they did stuff. And I find that all, I've always found that more interesting than just buying like a, a finished poster or a uh, print. Yeah, it's like buying a cookbook yeah. instead of a book of like photos of food. Yeah, there's something about seeing into someone's headspace and seeing the sketch work. It's just really gratifying. Where do they start? Do they start off in the face or the hands? Or yeah. The, like, do they start off with the leg? Like, what are they doing? Uh, when they're drawing a background, do they do perspective ones? Do they just freehand it? Or what are they doing? Just Does awesome their art look bad for a while before it looks good like they the rest save of it? us? <laughs> All right, there's a question for you guys. Does your art look bad before it looks good? Because mine looks oh. bad until it looks good. Oh yeah. oh yeah. I mean, it yeah. just like goes, it'll be like, oh, the sketch gets finalized and it looks great. And then I start flatting or something. It looks terrible. Again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I feel like a client project where they ask for a check-in like four days before it's due and you're like, you don't want to see it. You don't want <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Feel your money's been well spent. <laughs> yeah. That is the thing that terrifies that is the thing that terrifies me about bad doing layers. live streaming is like, oh no, people will see how terrible my art looks in the process. Like at least if it's a sped up video, then it kind of gets swept under the rug. But my God, live live art is, is ugly. There's bravery to that for sure. Um, all right, so we, we sort of covered the way that passions evolve over time, but the goalposts kind of move over time as well, right? And I, I for me, I don't think that the, the corollary between the personal work and the paid work changes. I think that demonstrating you can do something and do it at an extremely high level still translates even when your like goals of what you want to do level up. Like for, for DJ, I know that it's, it's making, you know, perhaps making producing your own show at, at a high level, which is the kind of, might be the reason you're doing a personal project where you're making a show in a more contained self-produced kind of a way. Right. My, my, end of just, I, Started off with pitching and going for the hard way first. And now I'm going back the other route where it's like getting it further along and then going back to the studios after you build up an even larger audience. Mm. Right, but there's still that personal project going and then you're gonna go and, and do that. So where yeah. are you, I mean, that, that's DJ, you have your answer, I guess, but like, feel free to go into more, more detail on it. Like, what are you guys trying to work towards now? And what are you doing personally to, to get there? I mean, I have like a ton of personal projects uh, at all times that are never going to be finished, um, but I'd like them to be finished. Uh, like, you know, I, I want to make, you know, like what DJ's doing. Like, I want to have like my own IP that's like, you know, fully like, you know, an extension of like my ideas and like my, you know, everything that I've learned. Um, so I'm like inching towards that, but then, you know, a cool gig comes along. It's like, whoops, I'm going to do that instead. <laughs> like, 
Yeah, I feel like I have no shortage of theoretical personal projects. And the problem with those is that ideas are only so special. And so if you sit on it for long enough, someone's going to come along and stomp on it and do it. And it doesn't matter if you would have done it better, they will do it first. And so learning to be okay with that. Um, I think having the full-time day job at Valve makes it very hard to come home and invest into personal projects. Um, but also I just get I, that same anxiety around sharing and social media just suddenly freezes me up and I, I just stop creating. So, I'm, Dude, I'm the same as you. That, that, all that resonates with me. I, I, I have an IP that I've worked on for so long and then every, every other, you know, once an idea is in your head, you know, someone else is going to come out with it. <laughs> yeah, right. So like you have to learn how to deal with that. Like, oh, they didn't even handle it well. They just spit out this garbage movie and they didn't even handle that concept interestingly. And now everyone's um, going to say you ripped off that thing. Yeah. Yeah, but you have to like, I, I find that like you just have to like find solace in like knowing that when you do do it, if you do it better, I don't, I, people might still point to it, but I think it'll still resonate with people. Um, yeah. And if if your themes and your storytelling still mean enough to you and, and, and resonate with enough people, it will be someone's first time watching that concept and they will always love it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, it's like the James Cameron Pocahontas thing, right? Like the Avatar. Yeah. It's like, it's just Pocahontas, but like they did it better. Like, Yeah, and most people don't even, I mean, most non-artists don't know that it's just Pocahontas. They just yeah. took that whole concept. Also, I saw that side eye, Claire. You like Pocahontas more? I like neither of those things. Okay. <laughs> I don't like the white savior story that he comes sure. in and he's the best Navi. You he's don't the like one the last there. samurai? What? <laughs> Hey, but at least this one has dragons. That's all I'm there for. That's fair. The creature design avatar, gorgeous. Why don't the Navi have six arms, but otherwise? Yeah, and also they have hair and nothing else does. Nah, there's problems. Yeah. Did the come out? You know, because no. I mean. So we're coming towards the end of the time we have on the panel. I think one thing that perhaps we should have addressed this earlier, but sometimes there's a perception that creating commercial work or working for a company is selling out. And I just want to hear your guys' take on that. How do you how do you feel about this? Just like to have it as a goal, to have it as something you want to do. I mean you gotta eat, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I like that. Nailed it. Oh, and I don't know. I, when I was going to school when I was younger, uh, they, I never thought that. I, I interacted with a lot of artists who would tell me that. And I started working two years into doing art like I just had a very super focus on getting jobs, super focus on doing well and excelling. But like I, I had friends who were like, you know, mostly fine artists, usually ones whose egos were bigger than their skill, who would like look down at you for, for wanting to go to a studio or, or work on someone else's project. Um, but I, I never thought so. I, man, I, I wanted to work and I wanted to tell my own stories and that, that, that working with people and, and gaining more skills from them, would, I thought was the fastest way to do it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, working at a company is just like second college, right? It's just like a learning experience. So you can take those skills and move them on to like, you know, the stuff you actually want to do. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like there's so much transparency now into how studios work and the individual artists behind these things that it's kind of really, it's destigmatized this idea of working for indie or larger companies over the past 10 to 15 years. Um, so I feel like a lot of students coming up now understand that it's not it's not selling out. We're just individuals trying to make cool things, and you can make cooler, bigger things with more people. Absolutely. I'm finding like right now in my career, I'm so, like I've worked with so many super talented people in like movies and TV shows and stuff like that. But like I'm really, really interested in these like young YouTubers like uh, who have like story time animations who are just killing it, doing oh their own God. original stuff just doing an awesome job building their own little communities and businesses. I, I love that. I, that's where I'm trying to go is go back to like the older goal, which is fun. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a really great way to look at it. Sort of an amalgamation of what all you guys have said is that like a, a paid opportunity and a paid place to work is an opportunity to learn from people who are so good, they get paid to do it. Mm -hmm. or like to take on a challenge that's difficult enough that it requires payment to, to attempt. So, you know, I think the stigma there should be, it should be less in the bit, right? Yeah. 
I also will bring this up too. Like you, you deal a lot early. A lot of us early on deal with like um, uh, the imposter syndrome, especially mm -hmm. when you get there and you're starting to work with like some of the most talented artists in the world, like at Lucas or something like that. And you're like, oh, you're gonna find out I'm not that good soon. And you like have to like deal with your own that those 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 pressures internally. Mm -hmm. But you'll find out if you talk about it with your friends that almost everyone's feeling the exact same way. Like. Yep. You, you all are kind of feeling that pressure and, and that and that worry that you're not as good as you think you are. And it's it's just really good to talk about it. Yeah, we actually did a whole panel on uh, mental health and imposter syndrome last year. Mm. It's something that's really pervasive in the creative industry. Boy, is it. But and it, it, it stops you from away. being creative, which sucks. Yeah, yeah. It's paralyzing. The best way to not do it is personal work. That'll get you out of your imposter syndrome. Okay, I'm just trying to tell <laughs> <laughs> Well, guys, look, that was a great chat. Thank you so much for your answers. They were really insightful and honest, and um, I, I really appreciate the chat. So um, I just want to thank my panelists, Claire Hummel, uh, RJ Palmer, and DJ Welch. Guys, you were wonderful. Any closing remarks, words of wisdom you'd like to throw into the void? Uh, draw shit you like to draw. <laughs> Ajay's that, Plus one to that. Just find ways to keep that passion. Um, when you're going to school and you're learning like those traditional drawings and, and make sure you're actually listening to your teacher because those flexing those new muscles is good and it'll only enhance your personal projects. Yep. Well said. Guys, this has been DeviantArt's personal work to paid work panel. Guys, thank you very much. Appreciate you. Stay safe out there, everyone.